Gracious and holy God, it is not about us or me, but about you. As we learn to walk in your ways, cast upon us not only the vision, but the courage. The courage to be brave and bold, even in times of uncertainty and unpopularity. Bless the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts. Might it be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. I want to share a story I experienced in the last church I served. I told the congregation that besides reading scripture, the one book I hoped that I could add to their bucket list before they left this world was a book by Philip Yancey called What's So Amazing About Grace. In fact, I encouraged them so much so we started a Bible study around that book in which Philip questions and examines the power of grace in the Christian life and in an unsafe world. I had prepared my Bible lesson that day, and in the beginning of the book, that pastor, um, a pastor from Chicago shared a story with Philip that basically went like this. He said, I met a young woman who was prostituting herself to the world. And I learned in our conversation that she was also sharing her four-year-old daughter to men who wanted kinky sex because she could earn more from her than she could in her own night's work. She sat in tears and said, I know that it's wrong, but I have to live. The pastor said to her, have you ever considered going to the church? And the woman's response was, I already feel terrible about myself. Why would I go to the church? They would just make me feel worse. And then Philip Yancey goes on to ask, what is so amazing about grace? We had been and started a ministry with a women's domestic violence shelter in town, the only shelter in seven Ohio counties. That's pretty sad in and of itself. And in our ministry, one woman came along. She would come to church faithfully, and when she heard about this book series and how highly I recommended it, she decided she would start that first day. Now my line of questioning down this road after this quote was read again by us was going to be, how would you, if you were in the pastor's position, respond to this young woman? Then, after we discussed that a bit, how do you think our church would respond if she got up and shared her story? And then thirdly, how do you think Jesus would respond to this woman. And if there were differences in those three responses, why? Why does our response not reflect Christ's response? I thought we would have some good and lively conversation and the young gal from the domestic child shelter shared with the class that she was trapped in human trafficking as a young girl. She's been forced into a life of prostitution do you mean to tell me, Pastor, that that was wrong? As I looked around the table, many eyes kind of just went down. My organist sat and smiled at me a little bit. Like, how are you going to answer this one, Pastor? <laughs> and I said, well, let me tell you. Who am I to judge you? Who am I to say what choices, or even in some cases not choices, you were left to make? Who am I to sit here as a sinner in needing of God's grace and tell you that I'm better than you? I'm no one to do that. But I do have a word for you. I believe wholeheartedly in my heart of hearts that is not the life. God wanted for you. You could feel the heaviness in the air. You can almost feel it now, can you? Then the woman asked me a question 
and shared some information that still haunts me today. She said, am I allowed to stay in your church? And I said, what? Yeah, am I allowed to stay in your church? What do you mean, stay? You're welcome to come and to worship, to be a part of us, to be one of us. I mean, what do you mean? She said, this is the seventh church. I've made this declaration in at some point. And in all the other six churches, within five to ten minutes, someone has ushered me to the door and asked me never to come back. Wow, I thought I had something to teach that day and found out I had something I needed to learn. Remember, Jesus, when he has decided to start his ministry, goes to the synagogue, which infers those who have been bar mitzvahed, those who are responsible. When you think of synagogue, think of Sunday school class. Those who seek to learn and live out what God's will is for their life. These are his peeps. He's at home. These are the people who knew him. These are also the people that probably looked upon him, if we just remember our Advent series, with a bit of suspicion as to who his paternal father is. But they've heard the stories. They've heard of the wonders. They've heard of his magical teaching. And they ask for a sign. Show us that what you have done in the other areas you do in your hometown. Jesus opens the prophet Isaiah's scroll and reads from it. And there's a little bit of debate as to whether which part he is reading from in the scholarly world. But he reads either from Isaiah 58. The first seven verses of that say, Shout it aloud, do not hold back, raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and the descendants of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek out, seek me out, and they seem eager to know my ways, as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commandments of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and you exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it not for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fast I have chosen? To loosen the chains of injustice, to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break their yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, you clothe them, and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. Isaiah is chastising his people in a prophetic way, so now you understand Jesus' comments about the prophet. The people were not living out the call of their faith. They were participating in their spiritual disciplines, hoping it would win God's favor rather than meet God's expectation. And no sooner did they end the fast or a Bible study or anything else than they back to quarreling. It's as if all that they had done had not drawn them closer to God and closer to God's mission. I may have said this in this pulpit before. I think it's pertinent even now. 
In the first church that I served, there was a men's Bible study that occurred in many pastors ago. I've heard this story told about it. Men would sit around and read a chapter of scripture and talk about its implication and transformation. And some would go off to work and the retirees, bless their hearts, would go to Bob Evans. <laughs> many cases of trailing pastor along. And as was the case this particular day, one of the scholars ordered his food and when it came, chastised quite severely the waitress who brought it, who brought the wrong thing. Shall I take it back, she asked. And he said, of course you should take it back. I should get what I want to pay, you know, what I ordered. And off he set her scurrying. The pastor leaned over to him at a moment when silence took the table and everyone heard and he said, now when she comes back, witness to her. <coughs> I wish I could be that clever and subtle. What does it mean when a woman is kicked out of seven churches because of her past? It means we've lost our way. Jesus is not speaking to the unchurched. He's speaking to those who seek knowledge and hopefully some transformation that occurs between the head and the heart. And in some way influences the action of his people. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, he says, to preach good news. He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, and to set the oppressed free. And as I meditated on this this week, I realized as I read its context, he wasn't only talking about the blind, the imprisoned, and the enslaved, physically those in the room. What are we blind and oppressed and imprisoned to in the church? And how would we respond if the Spirit of the Lord truly flew through us, flowed through us, created something new, wonderful, and disturbing? What would the church look like? We wouldn't have a dress code. It wouldn't matter if you showed up in sandals and sackcloth. <laughs> Honestly. But you know what? The church has communicated. Did I just light that thing on fire? <laughs> I saw Danny giggling and I'm like, oh no, my tie's gone. That's funny. I don't care who you are. <laughs> what if you didn't have to believe like us, behave like us, and become like us to belong to us? What if the message of faith was, I'm in prison too. I'm oppressed by my poor decisions and past choices and there's no way I can make up for it. I'm a sinner in need of grace and one who is loved by a Savior. What if our ministry wasn't about us and them, but all of us and Him? What if we realized we've been blind, blind all along to what God has been leading us and calling us? Our commission in the United Methodist Church is to go and make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. That's our mission statement. But I'll be honest with you, we don't do it. I have yet to sit with one of my district superintendents 
And for them to ask me the question, I'm really afraid it's going to catch on fire. <laughs> what have you done this year to make a disciple? And how much more bold we would be if that became an expectation. To preach good news to the poor in spirit, the poor in heart, the poor in faith. What would it mean for us to proclaim the good news of freedom for those imprisoned by their past, by expectations, by the pursuit of happiness in false ways? For those imprisoned by anger and hate over the injustice that they see but don't act upon. Preach the good news to those who have been maligned all along. To rescue the lost, the last, and the least. Do not be afraid with the stranger or the relative to share the good news of what God has done with us, even if we don't have all the answers. Even if we can't quote verse and chapter and book. If the pancake breakfast were like the soup kitchen, and we would feed the world. I'm not dogging pancake breakfasts. I like it just as much as you do. I'll be down there after service. <laughs> but what if we really embraced Jesus' commission to us as he rose into heaven? Now look at all I've done for you and all the hope and all the joy filled in your heart that death will not overcome us. Go and make disciples. Baptizing them, that means receiving them into your membership. Teaching them all that I have taught you. Entering into a true covenant and community relationships. Not one set with certain strings if people would make certain decisions or people would do certain things. But one that says no matter what. I go to church as is my custom, as was Jesus' custom. And I don't believe that I can find God just as much on a golf course or in front of my TV. But I come into a community of faith to give, not to get each Sunday. To bring an offering, not just money, but my week, my life, my future, that I place my hope in the hands of and entrust those who make decisions. That my life has been changed that all those empty seats that are here today represent all those missing who could help make us complete. I have yet to have someone walk in my office as many times as I've asked congregations to do this and to ask me the question, what have you done this week to make a disciple? I get emails where people say, you know, so-and-so is sick, you haven't been out to see him. Are they saved? I'm not against comfort and care. But we are more concerned about our own comfort. Our own definition of what is right and what is wrong. The way that we should dress, how we should speak, whether we have the right theology. Whether we preach enough about scriptures or not, then we do really trust in you that God is working in the church in the world. We are more concerned about our comfort and our care and our traditions than we are about changing in such a way that those who are not here yet would feel welcome. Are you getting offended yet? Because maybe you would be like one of those in the synagogue that day that went from a man who was high on their list to one they wanted to throw off a cliff when it was all said and done. Folks, there's a word for that. Guilt. It speaks to the heart and should transform us and inform us in some way. 
You see, because between Isaiah 58 and the scripture that I read for you in Isaiah 61, the exact scripture that we believe Luke is quoting here when Jesus is in the synagogue, is a whole bunch of chapters on repentance, on sin, and upon turning back. And then the prophet has this good word for us. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the captives, and release from darkness for prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, and to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, an oil of joy instead of mourning, in a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair, to be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated by generations. Then Jesus quotes one more term. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. He has anointed me to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. <laughs> Leviticus 25 speaks of the year of Jubilee. In scriptural ways, the number seven is a way of saying something is complete. The world was created in seven days. The year of Jubilee occurs the year after seven years of, or seven periods of seven years occurs. So it's in the 50th year. And in that year, everyone was set equal. The land that you had to give away, that you owed to someone else, the ways in which you were enslaved, you were free from. Your land was returned to you. It was a sum zero game. Those who were more prosperous gave back to those who were less prosperous. And you're warned. Just because it's the 49th year, don't. Do not withhold lending to someone because you know next year you're going to have to just let them free of their obligation. No more mortgages. No more debt. Here's the interesting thing. In all the study of the year of Jubilee in Judaism, there's no evidence it was ever practiced. The idea is, we are all equal. The past is the past, and it's sealed up. You are returned <coughs> to the state in which you entered in this period. The year of Jubilee has come. And the way that that debt is paid, and you are made free, comes through a cross 30 years. But even though, brothers and sisters, we have not lived up yet to the church God has called us to be, to the people God has called us to be, there is still good news. What's so amazing about grace? We're all equal. And if we would but turn back, we're all forgiven. And that's good news. That's what God wants us to know. That's what God wants us to teach and to preach into the streets, into the county, into the state, into the world. If you would but give up your plan and get on my plan, God says, you shall be free. And I believe God doesn't look at us on what we've done in our past. I believe it doesn't matter what mistakes, poor choices, inactivity, in what ways we have taken the Bible and twisted it. In what ways we have defined for our own comfort and care. God still loves us. He still wants us. He still died for us we would like to turn back. 
if we are to walk in his shoes, walk in his ways, then we need to be prophets of that message. To help those who don't see, those who feel trapped, to find a place in the faith, to walk in the way, as people humbled, forgiven, and freed. We have a beautiful symbol of what Christ was trying to say to us. It's a meal. One set at a table that remembers the story of God's saving action in our lives. After wandering in the wilderness, the people were set free. On that night so long ago when Jesus was in the upper room with his friends, remembering God's love for his people, he picked up the bread, he blessed it and gave it to his friends and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. As often as you gather together in my name, eat and remember me. When the meal was over, he took the cup. The third cup from the table of four. The cup commonly known as the cup of redemption. He blessed it and gave it to his friends and said, This is a cup of my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you gather in my name, drink and remember me. Why don't you pray with me? Gracious and holy God, we thank you for the gift of a body broken and bloodshed. We pray the Spirit would anoint these gifts and all who receive them today. May they in wonderful and powerful ways renew us in body heart and mind. Cast upon us a spirit of wholeness and reconciliation as we draw to you as people of faith. Renew and strengthen us that we might walk in oneness with each other and in unity and mission to all the world. To preach the good news. To set the prisoner free. To give recovery of sight to freedom of the oppressed, to proclaim the year that we are all free once again. Come Holy Spirit.